Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peter and welcome to another tutorial. This time we're going to talk about APIs and how to use them. Now this tutorial is aimed mostly at uh, beginners. So if you are fairly new to C Sharp and you would like to, uh, let's say, uh, add new possibilities for your programming, then uh, this tutorial is just for you uh, because we're going to talk about uh, something that's very exciting, which, uh, you know, APIs certainly are. Uh, so what I did uh, thus far is I made a new console app, uh, console app uh, in C Sharp. Now, um, just use Visual Studio's new um, project uh, wizard. I just created a console app, right? Console app in .NET Core. Um, that's probably good to uh, mention that I'm going to be demonstrating everything um, with .NET Core. Uh, if you are watching this in the future and there's just .NET 5, 6, 7, etc., then just use that, which is based so because that's basically core. But enough talking about nonsense. Let's get right into it. Uh, and the first thing uh, we need to talk through is uh, what actually APIs are. So I have a website here. It's called Wallhaven, wallhaven.cc. You can go to it yourself. It's perfectly fine. Um, it's a wallpaper website. And it, you know, it gives you, well, you know, wallpapers, right? And it's updated fairly frequently. So maybe from time to time, I just want to uh, browse around here and pick a wallpaper that I like. Um, but I don't like doing that uh, manually. And since, you know, we are programmers, it would be really cool if we could get these wallpapers uh, programmatically. Um, maybe we want to set them. So like maybe every day it goes to this, you know, website, finds a wallpaper and sets it as our wallpaper, right? And maybe that just happens automatically and we don't have to do anything. That's cool. That's exciting. Or we want to do something else with our wallpaper, like send it to Discord or something. Um, so normally, because this is on a web page somewhere, um, we, uh, I mean, we could do what basically what the browser does, right? We could actually just like go to this specific URL, read the HTML code because there's like a, there's an HTML and CSS uh, code that basically, um, you could, you could see it probably have seen it before in, uh, inspector it looks like this right which basically says how this uh, should be rendered and uh, if we use the debugger tool uh, where we can pick a specific element you can see that technically speaking uh, these all these L LE elements are all the individual wallpapers and we technically speaking could read this whole thing as like a string and find um, the actual um, you know the actual path to the wallpaper, but that's not ideal because that's a lot of extra work that we're doing. And a lot of the times, if the design of the web page changes, which happens fairly frequently, um, maybe our program would stop working. And so that's why uh, there's uh, there are APIs, which are um, application programming interfaces. Now, um, how do you know if a website has an API? Um, well, that's going to be different for um, different websites, of course. Uh, what I found here on Wallhaven is that they do have a little uh, frequently asked questions category, uh, which I thought this would be a, 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 a question that's frequently asked. So if I just search for API here, uh, one of the questions indeed is, do you offer an API? And they say we do, and they give you a link to the documentation of it. So ideally, you would find the documentation um, of uh, your desired API on the website that you're uh, after. Now, um, feel free to use this one for an example. Um, and let's just go through uh, what this all means, how to read the documentation and what some of the um, most important things are going to be. So first of all, um, most APIs, well, if not all, uh, unless you have, unless there are some like um, wild protocols like gRPC, or if you just do it through WebSockets, um, most of the most of the APIs are going to return some uh, your data in 
a format called JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript object notation, but that's not really important because we don't do, we don't actually just work with JavaScript when we're working with C sharp. It's just what the standard uh, is called and uh, what it was originally for as well. But, and it looks like this, except for the first line, uh, the, the, this line in this case for this documentation, uh, the get uh, and a URL means, oh, if you sent a GET request to this URL, you will get this, right? So this isn't actually part of the part of the the response of the API. What we will get back is a string that contains all this. And we can give it a go because uh, they give you all the all the different API endpoints, which are basically URLs that you can go to that will return um, that will return JSON. So uh, let's see, let's see something like searching, right? Here, ser search listings, uh, yeah, are accessed via URL. So this one, right? So it's a wallhaven.cc forward slash API uh, v1 search. So if we go to that URL, can do it right here. You can see that I get um, I get uh, JSON. Now this looks weird. It's like, well, how come this is like styled? Um, well, the reason is that I'm using Firefox and Firefox actually automatically formats this for you. If you click uh, the raw data tab, that this is actually what we will get back. If we call this from C sharp, um, if we try to like get this web page from C sharp, you're, we're going to find this, right? Which is, this is JSON. We're going to talk about what JSON really looks like. Uh, you could also find the uh, parsed representation if we just want to go through all the properties and uh, create our model, but that's for later. Don't worry about it. So for now, let's just get a very, very quick primer to what J what JSON actually is, because this looks kind of scary, right? Like, Peter, I understand this, but um, I don't know what these what these uh, curly braces are. There's plenty of double quotes. I don't like that. Can we just not? Um, so um, the minimum there's like four things you need to understand about JSON asset. Um, basically, the lowest level uh, uh, building block of uh, a JSON uh, piece of data is a key value pair. And it's always, uh, in double quotes, a name of something, a key, right? Then there's a colon and a value. Now, the value doesn't always have to be in double quotes. It does for string, for text but it doesn't for things like numbers or you know well, basically numbers um so just just don't be just don't be surprised that maybe that sometimes uh, the right side of a key value pair doesn't have double quotes um that's it's permissible in some cases uh but it, it's also permissible in like the the left side but don't don't think about it too much um we don't want to complicate it too too much just know that there's like a thing it's like a name like what's the name of whatever we just requested and then the right side is the actual value right like oh the name is anime right cool so that's one building block but then what about these what about these curly uh braces well Sometimes you want to have a a collection, like maybe one wallpaper. This is a good good example here, right? Here uh, we have many wallpapers and every wallpaper has multiple things. It has like, it has an ID, it has a URL, it has the number of views, it has a ratio. So, and this, and you want to like somehow logically bundle these into a, a coherent object, right? And that's why uh, you you can use uh, the curly braces. Where did I leave that here? Right. So, for example, an avatar is a collection of uh, the the two hundred uh, two hundred mm -hmm, two hundred pixel variant, the hundred and twenty eight, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's it's a, it's a collection of um, key value pairs. Now you could also have a collection of just values. Uh, now now. And that's called an array. Instead of uh, curly braces, if you use uh, if you use square brackets, then uh, you don't actually put key value pairs in it. You just put the values. You just put the right sides in it. Uh, what do you like? Why would you use this as opposed to uh, an object? Well, um, 
you don't have to you can put as many of these as you want and you don't need to know the name like for example here right in the avatar if you want to get this value the 32 pixel variant you need to know the name right you need to know which key are you're looking for um but you can't just infinitely add like you could add them but you would still need to remember all these uh all these uh keys whereas in a uh, color array you don't care because you know that just like it with indexing just like in c sharp arrays are indexed from zero so this is the zeroth element this is the first element second etc right and you don't need to remember what they called uh, the key you just know that in colors maybe you just want the you know the the value with the index three which is zero one two three right don't worry if you like don't fully grasp the concept of it i'm pretty sure it's going to be uh it's going to be more clear when we put it into practice and we are going to do that as soon as possible <laughs> um so let's um let's actually get some data from um from an api so one of the one of the easiest um calls that we could probably make would either be you know just a category thing so that we get a tag or and that's probably better we're going to do a search which we already kind of did uh without an api key sometimes oh that's a, that's very important to mention um sometimes um sometimes apis need authentication right sometimes it's a it's not a public thing this is a public api so that anyone can request it at any point um but a lot of the times um you're gonna find that uh, a lot of the apis will require an api key um the easiest way of providing it is through uh, something called a parameter or like a query option where you literally just append it just like they say just like they show in this example as opposed to just doing the search you do the search and then also question mark api key equals and then this is where you would uh, put your api key now um, the the method of getting an api key is different for um you know the different apis uh here you just need to log in go to your settings and you will get um you will get an api key um for different applications you would probably have to go somewhere into settings and there's a way of obtaining an api key and sometimes you will have to maybe pay for an api key or do something special um that sort of a thing but we're going to be fine uh without the api key because you only need the api key if you want to get not safe for work uh, wallpapers so if you want to do some spicy stuff and you are an adult and you're allowed to do that and it's perfectly fine then absolutely add an api key and and see what you want to see now uh we're gonna let's get this let's get this string of json uh through c sharp because this is nice but how do i get this in c sharp so uh we will need the url and since i know that for my application the url will not ever change i'm going to declare it as a constant in my uh, program class right so what i'm going to do here is like inside the, the the program class not inside my method because i don't really i feel like it's just, it should be scoped for the entire application for in this case for this class because uh, we're gonna we're not gonna worry about structure yet so I'm just going to declare a uh, constant string and call it the, um, what did we have? Well, it's like a search. Yeah, sure. Um, so like wallpapers URL, something like that, right? And then I'm just going to put in the string in it like this. So that way, whenever I, I say wallpapers URL uh, in my in my code, of course it means the this url now how do i connect to the internet and um you know and get that string get that text well i can use something i can use a uh a class that's already in dotnet called http client now 
clearly HTTP is you know the protocol. That's why you. That's why we start HTTP. Um, that's why we start URLs with with HTTP. I granted we use HTTPS, but there's no difference. You can make HTTPS calls with HTTP client. Don't worry about that. It's all right. So uh, we're going to make a new instance of that. So first of all, I'm just gonna create like a let's say client bar client, and we're gonna create a new HTTP client. Now HTTP client comes from a namespace called system.net.http, right? Um, where Microsoft was so kind to define uh, this HTTP client class for us, and we can just make a new instance of it. Uh, if we look at the constructors, uh, we can either put in nothing. Uh, we can also put in an HTTP message handler. In this case, was that uh, the HTTP handler stack to use for sending requests, so we can uh, customize it quite a bit. Uh, and also a dispose handler, which is that's uh, wild. Feel free to read all about it because it's exciting stuff to explore all the different things you can do with all these classes. If you want to, if you're curious, which I would absolutely always encourage. You can just search for uh, C Sharp and then the class you want, which is probably going to pop up with MSDN here. And you can see that this is the one because it, it is in the uh, systemnet HTTP uh, namespace. And it's going to tell you all about it. It's going to give you an example, in fact, right? Which is that's crazy. That's crazy good. Now, uh, if we just read all about it, we're going to find a piece of information that I wanted to tell you from the get go. But if I would just like tell you that, like as it's like dogma, it's like just believe me, it's you. It would basically lose its effect. And so uh, the reason why I wanted you to to actually look at the at the documentation is this piece of information here, where they say HTTP client is intended to be instantiated once per application rather than per use see remarks and you could probably go to remarks here and see yeah that the, the you know the, the reasoning for it in more details but this is important for us because what we did here instinct instinctively and it's not wrong we're um you know we're just normal programmers we just made a, a new instance basically per use in inside a inside a method now granted it's inside a main method and after we are done using our client uh the entire application uh exits but it's still because we don't know how much this will grow and it will grow i already know but whatever in you know what i mean right so we're gonna follow their example and we're gonna declare it as a static read. Uh, do we want to have it read only uh, we're just going to declare it uh, in our uh, class scope, right? So here, what I'm going to do, um, we cannot have it. Oh, so uh, it's like, well, Peter, why, why don't you just have it uh, constant, just like our wallpaper URL? That's a really good question because look, let, let's let's give that a go, right? If I do HTTP client and I call it client, just like this, and I try to do a new HTTP client, it's going to tell me that uh, that's not uh, that bright of an idea because it says that if you're if you're making something constant, then the right side, the actual value, it must be it must be uh, constant. So that way the expression being assigned to must be constant. And this is not constant because it um, it's not a value per se. It makes a new instance an action in a way, right? So we cannot have it constant, but we can maybe put some additional uh, modifiers on it that will make it um, that will make it better. Like by default, it's uh, implicitly private. Now, if you don't if you don't remember what um, uh, what, what modifiers are applied. Uh, implicitly, meaning if I put private here or if I don't, it's still private. It's the same thing because they just it just assumes that it's private if I don't put anything in there. Uh, but I want to be clear, right? So we have basically this. We have a private HTTP client, which is fine because we make a new instance of it. And if we just use it, that's fine. Uh, but they also said uh, that it might be a good idea to have it read only because we could still here say, client with a capital C referring to this 
uh, also this needs to be uh, this is a good point we're also going to get to that um, this should be static uh, in this case we want it to be static because um, we are calling it from a static method and remember static methods cannot access instance variables now what does that mean well uh, unless a variable of a class is static it's going to be a, an instance variable it only exists when something makes an instance of that class right so if i make a uh, if i make a private integer foo i know this is a diversion like wild wow, like, computer why are you talking about that when you're supposed to talk about apis it's like no 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 listen it's a, i feel like it's more important for for the journey for the exploration it's like yes our goal ultimately is to get an api to work but we find all these interesting concepts that we can learn about along the way and i feel like it's important to do so unless you're like in a professional setting you just need to know how to operate an api uh, by all means if you if that's the case then oh don't oh i'm sorry don't waste time with this tutorial um there's plenty of uh, there's actually um uh, i think think there's a really good guide on msdn uh, but then again you're probably smart enough to figure that out if you're uh, in a rush in the meantime though we will talk about <laughs> instance variables um so foo doesn't uh you know foo is just like an integer it's a number and if we try to access foo from a static method and we say just foo is three then it's gonna say um yeah but like an object reference is required for the non-static field um, basically for us to ac access a non-static field method or property uh, in this case i'm going to make it public so we can access it uh, anywhere else and the reason why we cannot access foo is because we don't have an instance and we can make an instance by saying new program that's how you make an instance of a class right like hey so we can make a new instance of a class but then we have to say which foo we're talking about we're talking about the foo that's inside the p instance right like it could work uh, but then again um we do not actually have an instance right and so we make we can make a uh, a variable static which means there's only going to be like a like an implicit instance of it right there's no there you don't need to get an instance to to access it it's just it just exists there now static is a bit of a bit of a weird thing you're you're not supposed to actually use it as much because if you if you do uh, if you start using it uh usually start using it as a crutch just to like get things um done easily but for this um for, for this tutorial, we're going to use it. And I know it's a, like a tutorial code smell where people tell you like in a real application, you wouldn't do that and this. Uh, but we haven't talked about like very important fundamental concepts of structure. So for now, it's absolutely fine for us to like learn about it. As long as our application doesn't grow too, too much, it's going to be fine. Uh, but even if it's static, we can still make new instances of the client, uh, client class, HTTP client class, which we don't want because as if you remember the, um, the MSDN documentation said, uh, that it's supposed to be instantiated once per application, but here we are instantiating it once and then again. So what can we prevent that? Because this could have been an accident. I mean, I did that intentionally, but this could have been an accident. And if we make it, um, if we make it read only, I don't know about the order how I prefer it. I'm pretty sure you could, you could, like, I'm pretty sure the order doesn't matter. It's valid either way: private read only, static, or private static read only. I don't know what I'm, what I'm like, what I like more. Um, that's fine, I guess. Um, now, whenever we try to assign it. I was gonna say that it's a that it's an error because um, you're trying to assign uh, a read-only field. Now, why would I generate errors? Well, in this case, I'm just utilizing a feature of the language to make sure that I don't break my own rules. 
right? And at this point, I'm writing all of the code and so I could remember what I'm doing. But sometimes you're working in a team and one person writes this line and then another person writes the rest of the application. It's kind of like a school project. Um, and they don't know. They don't know, right? So maybe but by utilizing the, the language features um, to do what you want to do, um, you're making sure that you don't break your own rules, right? So here, we don't need to make an instance of the, of the client because we already have it. It's already implicitly there. So instead, we can, well, we can either, of course, like look how they, they operate uh, with the example, which is always a great idea. You can see that they uh, call it get async. Remember, get is the, uh, uh, it's the, what do they call it? Like, um, <clears throat> like an HTTP, uh, like a something method, uh, forget. So, uh, but you remember that this, the, the API also references get, that you're supposed to, uh, send a get request to, to this URL, right? So clearly we could probably assume that, Hey, okay. That's a get request, right? And they just put in a URL. So I could probably do that. And it gives me like a response object. So let's give that a go, right? So we're gonna get a response. And um, let's say, oh, of course, and we just do client get async. And the URL is wallpapers URL because it's the constant that we, that we declared earlier. Now, there's a bit of a problem because I said that this is gonna give me a um, an HTTP response message. Uh, it doesn't at this point, because if I hover over it, it'll, uh, it'll tell me that it's a task. So for example, let's say I overlook it and they say that the response has an ensure success status code. If I do that, I'm going to run into a problem because this will tell me that, oh, there's no ensure success status code. And it's like, hmm, well, that's weird because the MSDN clearly said that there is. I know I'm missing something that's a very big spoiler, but um, just in, you know, because you may stumble on this issue plenty of times. I know I did a couple of times, you know, it's like a fairly, it's like you read the, the error message, you're like, oh, okay, I'm just dumb. Um, the, the important thing is that it doesn't say the HTTP response message does not contain ensure status, uh, ensure success status code. It says that a task of H, uh, HTTP response message, which basically means what a task is, is like a, it's like a, it's an operation, it's a task, it's an operation that will take a bit of time. And the reason why we have tasks is because maybe we don't want to wait for that, right? Like you could imagine that maybe you want to save a game or like, uh, yeah, you're, you're in the middle of calculations. So you want to save, um, some result or whatever, right? So you've got the result you want it to save and it takes time to save, uh, but you don't want to wait for it. You just want to continue with the, uh, with whatever you're doing. Maybe you just want to like write a little file, or, like start drawing confetti on screen. Right. And, uh, so that's called asynchronicity. You could, you could run a task asynchronously so that it, so that we don't wait for it. But in this case, we really want to wait for the response because what are we doing? Like, we just want to get a wallpaper and I can't get this wallpaper unless the server actually, unless I wait for the server to tell me all the wallpapers that I can get or this the data of this wallpaper of this image or whatever right so we need to await it whenever something has async uh in the method name except for methods that you write where you forget async uh to add async to that method or it's written by someone else who doesn't care about that uh, or doesn't follow this particular standard um you can always know what the return type of that method is because it tells you it's, if it's a task, then hey, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is if you're returning a task, but async in the name because it's easier for you to uh, figure that out. Um, but whenever you have a task, you could 
before the call, put the await keyword. But we're gonna pop one, we're gonna fix this issue, but we're gonna get another one. Because it will tell you that you can only use the await keyword, the, the await operator within an async method. And this is not an async method. How do you make a method be async? And can you apply it to a main, to the main method? Because a lot of the times you would be like, well, I could do it for my own methods, uh, but I'm not sure about the main one. Uh, in Since like C Sharp 7, I'm pretty sure, um, you can actually have an async main. And the way you do it, instead of returning void, we will be returning a task just like they do, just like they do. They return a task, but they return a task of HTTP response message. We're just going to return a task. We're not going to type it. And then, so of course, for that, we're going to have to uh, add, a, add a namespace. Um, and task is actually in system threading tasks, right? So we need that using directive. Or we could we could technically speak just like like actually force append it right there, and then we wouldn't need that. But then again, it's neater to have it as a using directive so that we don't have to type it every time we use a task. And then once it is returning a task, we can put async in front of it. So we have a static async task returning main, uh, commonly referred to as async main. Now, if this is uh, if this has like green squigglies and it tells you that, well, you need a uh, C sharp seven, this is like a C sharp seven feature. It probably has some intelligence to, to change that in your project. Um, C sharp seven is fairly common in, in core projects. So it shouldn't be anything that's like, you know, out of the ordinary or you should avoid or anything. This is, that's perfectly normal. Now, now we've got what we wanted, right? Because we have, um, we, we sent a get request. And so this, this line here, the ensure success status code, all it does is it will throw an exception. It will fail when, if the, um, if the, if that request failed and the request could fail from Multi multitude of reasons. It could fail because our internet connection uh, is offline or the server isn't online or the server encountered an error or we don't have permissions to do that. Or, which is one of the, one of the uh, limitations that they will tell you about, API calls are currently limited to 45 per minute. So we can only do 45 requests per minute, which is like, that's fine, like per minute, let's be honest. Uh, we want to run it like once a day um, to change our wallpaper. It's fine, right? But if, if we're testing, if we're testing it and we're like really repeating the calls over and over, uh, we might hit this limit and it will it will give us a 429 uh, response, too many requests. And that will be recognized by this method here on top of the response as a unsuccessful status code. And this will throw, and this will end our application here. It'll tell us like that it failed or whatever. Um, how do we avoid that? Well, first of all, yes, don't call it as often. Okay, that's a, that's a possibility. Another option is uh, to specifically check for the status code check for the 429 and when that happens we can wait for a minute and then try again um, but for the simplicity for the brevity of this tutorial this is just like an idea like an exercise that you could try uh, but for the brevity of this tutorial I, let's just not let's just be fine with it failing um, so what happens when we actually get the response back well, we want the, the text, we want the actual, uh, this whole string, this whole JSON thingy, this whole JSON data string. So um, let's make a new variable for it. Let's just store it in a variable called JSON. And we're gonna read the JSON from the response. So to do that, if you look what's inside the response, 
there is content. Actually, if we may also refer to, I'm not expecting you to just like magically know it. You can actually look at the, um, look at the, the example here and they say, oh, well, they have a response. They in, on, in the response, there's a content object and it has a read as string async method. Now, again, remember it has async in its name. Therefore it returns a task of string. Uh, I know it's a task of string because, well, cl clearly you read it as a string. So, uh, but it's async, so it returns a task of string. So therefore, we can await it um, to get the string from it, and that's exactly what we're gonna do, right? Content read as string async, and then again, remember that well, this is just at this point a task of string. So let's await that, right? And then we just get a string. Now this is uh, this is. Basically, it's like maybe you're like, well, Peter, you just like, like, is that okay that you're like copy pasting stuff technically or it is absolutely okay. I would, I would much, I would be much happier if you could find what you're looking for and understand. But here's the, instead of like mindlessly copy pasting, it's like, well, Peter, you could have just like copy pasted this whole thing and just changed the URL and you're done. Yes, but I feel like it's way better to to actually see the implications of what you're doing, to to try to learn about it so that you can maybe understand the the overarching concept, the why, like why is there an await, right? In fact, why do they have an async task main, right? Well, clearly because it needs to be an async, uh, it needs to be, um, yes, it needs to be an async uh, method so that we, they can await stuff, right? But we... We didn't read it here. We didn't just like copy paste it and assume that that's just like what life is. We actually saw the problem. If we didn't await it. This would be a task of something. And that task of something doesn't have the method that we need. So we need to wait it. But to await it, it needs to be async. And we can have an async mate, right? So we actually understand the implications of it, which I think is way more important than just like knowing where to copy paste from. Um, Plus, hey, maybe it's just me, but it's kind of exciting. All right, so, well, can we, like, I want to see what's in this JSON now. So what we can do, very simply, is we can just put a breakpoint here and run the application in debug mode. Now, it's going to perform all these operations, and it's going to stop. And once it stops here, we can hover over our JSON, and we can see that, yep, you know what, data, ID, there's a URL, you know, uh, it has a bit bit more slashes than usual than we would expect because remember it told us here well it's like well peter it told us that uh we're gonna get something like that right data id and url you can see two forward slashes you yeah, know forward slash then how come i have like a backslash in front of you know well it's not in front of everything this one this one really escapes like uh it's like double escape. It's like, how come I have a lot of like forward slashes? Don't worry about it. It's really just a, uh, it's an, it's a way of escaping a string literal. So to understand that, imagine we just have a, it's super simple. Don't worry about it. Uh, like if we have a foo, we have a string here and it's, uh, you know, you define a string in double quotes, right? But what if you want to put a double quote in your double quoted string? Well, if you do that, it's going to be like, well, your string ends here, and then I don't know what C is. Okay, well, there are things in C Sharp that you could do to fix this. One of them is, well, you could uh, declare this as a string literal uh, by putting an at symbol in front of it, which still wouldn't fix it, but it allows you to use two double quotes to signify one double quote. It was like, well, Peter, but if I use two, how do I signify two double quotes? Well, by four, because this is one double quote and this is the second double quote. Or alternatively, and this is what the representation that we just saw decided to do, when, you're, when you don't mean a literal character, like a literal double quote, you just mean it as part of the text, then you can put a backslash in front of it. And that doesn't, that means, oh yeah, like, hey, what's after this is part of the text, not like, don't read it as like C-sharp code. We like, well, okay, Peter, but like, how do I put a backslash in there? Yeah, by again, 
escape by backslashing the backslash. This is a representation of a single backslash. And again, what if I want two of those? You'll, you'll put four of them, right? Because it's always the pairs, right? This means, hey, the next thing isn't, tr th this is, it goes kind of meta, right? Because this means, hey, the next character doesn't actually mean um, like what C sharp thinks it's mean. It's what C sharp thinks it means, which means end of a string. So it's not that. So it's okay. So it's just a, uh, just a double quote. Whereas this basically says, hey, the next thing isn't actually what C sharp thinks it means, which is the next thing doesn't actually mean you right it's the cell it's a self refer referential so the this is how it escapes basically the backslash i'm just like i have a beautiful way of overcomplicating everything thinking about everything for too for too long and too hard but that's hopefully if someone is into that because otherwise it's just boring sorry for that okay so next thing we have that json but i want to I want to, I want just like a specific part of that JSON. I want, I want just like maybe the first URL to uh, the wallpaper, right? And we can actually use the JSON property here to see uh, what we're looking for. And maybe we're just looking for path, which this should give us if we open that. That's, those are, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, ice cream, popsicles. Cool. Uh, I'm distracted now, <laughs> but no. All right. So we're looking for the path because that actually includes the full path to the image. Um, okay. So how do I get that? I could write my own parser of JSON, but that would be too expansive and I could make mistakes and it's not very versatile. I couldn't use that. Um, you know, I would have to rewrite it for everything that I'm looking for. So unless I write an actual JSON interpreter or parser. Um, so instead, we're going to use a, a library. Now, .NET actually has a, a, a JSON library. Uh, if we can we can probably find it by system text JSON C sharp because they do have uh, here system text json namespace it contains things but there's also a how to serialize and deserialize a json in dotnet uh they give you well this is a bit older well i, I don't know if it's older or if it's just like not pushing their own stuff they tell us what we want we will use newtonsoft json library it's a very common one very very common library uh, you will find it in almost any project that uses JSON, which is almost any project. <laughs> um, but you could also, oh, did they just say that you, like, it's usually Newton sub JSON, but we can use, oh, yeah, right. So it's like we're going to use Newton sub JSON, but you can use whatever uh, .NET already has in it, which is which means you, you wouldn't need the, the library. Um, and that's system text JSON, serialization or deserialization. Um, I wanted to use JSON and I will. <laughs> cool. Um, so how do we add a, uh, a library to our, uh, project? Well, we can use something called a NuGet, which is basically like a package manager. It's something that can give us all the packages that we want. Uh, if we right click on our project. Uh, and go to manage NuGet packages. Uh, you need Visual Studio for this, of course. Um, but you could do it in a command line. But I suppose that if you are into that and if you know that, then this tutorial is like crazy boring for you. Um, so manage NuGet packages, where you can find all of the installed packages, which is nothing for us so far, or we can browse all the different packages that exist. And believe it or not, the number one package already in there is Newton sub JSON. That's what we want. If it's not there, you can search for it. Newton soft. Uh, there it is, right? Newton sub JSON. And to install it, we simply select the version that we want. Latest stable is usually the smartest idea. And then we hit install. 
is going to uh, want us to accept some uh, terms of terms of use or something. Sometimes packages do that. And we have it basically installed. Now, once we have it installed, you can verify that by uh, opening dependencies under our project packages. And you can see that, yeah, hey, there, there's a Newtons of JSON package here. Uh, so now we know it's there. And that also means that we can now add using directives of that package and use types that are defined in that library. Now it's going to, IntelliSense is going to suggest uh, what, what using directives we're missing if we try to use things. So, however, we f want to ideally make a model. We want to make a C sharp representation of all these objects of this. Now you can see here that this kind of looks like um, like C sharp, right? This kind of looks like a C sharp uh, collection. It's like you could you could think that you could make a class called data, and it could have all these properties, and or you could make a class called not not like seven, but maybe like a wallpaper, and it would have all these things. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do. So we want to take a look at the representation of this, but we want to see it here in the API, because first of all, it tells us that there is like a, an object underlying root object, and that root object has a property called data, which is an array of objects. It's an array of these wallpapers, right? So it gives us, so first we have data, which is an array of all the wallpapers that we found. And then also uh, you have a property called meta, which is an object containing things like the current page, the last page, you know, the total number of wallpapers found, etc. right? So that's what we need to represent. Let's do that. But in order to deserialize all of that, deserialization basically means converting text, like converting this JSON into an object in C Sharp. Um, in order to do that, we're going to need to, um, uh, so, so we don't have to define every single key value in our model. We can only, we, it's perfectly okay for us to define only the properties that we care about. So even though there's meta here and it's an object, I don't care about it. I don't, I don't want to know how many wallpapers there are. So I'm just not going to have it. So instead, what we're going to do here is we're going to make a new class. I'm going to, in fact, make a new uh, folder here in my project by right clicking the project hitting add new folder I'm going to call it entities and inside entities I'm going to make two new entities two new classes so first I'm going to add a new class and I'm going to call it um, wallpaper search response right because that's when I when I search for wallpapers this is the object that I will get back and this represents the root object, this whole, the root thing, you know, and we know that it has a, um, it has a property, which is a, an array of wallpapers, right? It has a thing that's called data, right? So for example, here, let's make a public, well, I'm going to make the whole class public in case I want to use it from different assemblies later on. We're going to talk about that. So the wallpaper search response, as we said earlier, has a property called data. Now it is okay for you to uh, type in the name uh, with uppercase letters, even though it has lowercase in the in the key. That's perfectly fine. The problem is when something has an underscore and you don't want an underscore in there. Um, we're, I'll explain that in just a quick second. Uh, but the data type, I forgot the data type. Um, in this case, it's an array. It's an array of, uh, of these wallpaper objects. And I'm going to have like an object called wallpaper model. So I know it's going to be wallpaper model. And it's an array of those. So I could either do literal like an array. Also, I'm going to add a getter and a setter. 
So I could either do an array or I could wrap this in an I enumerable of, or I could put an, uh, put it in a list. It's, it's completely fine to do, uh, whichever I find necessary. Now this of course doesn't work because there is no such a thing as wallpaper model. And so what I will do here is I will create another class and where we're, we're going to talk through the whole thing, uh, again, in just a second which is going to be a public class. This one represents this object, this object here. And in it, we only care about path, right? Does it have a path? Oh yeah, hey, here, path, which contains the URL, which is a string. So we can just have a public string path. And that's it. We don't have to define all the other properties that we don't care about. It's all right. So uh, here we have a wallpaper search response, which has an array of wallpaper models. And every wallpaper model has a string path, right? Um, that's fine. This is perfectly fine. Um, we're now going to talk about I enumerable because this video is already so long. Uh, there's going to be another part where we're going to delve into plenty more of other things. Uh, but just so that we, like, I want that by the end of this tutorial, we at least get the first goddamn image. All right, so um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we have our JSON. Now we want to turn it into a uh, response. Now, we already have response, so let's say a wallpaper, wallpaper response. Or like API response, right? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So here we're going to use something from the library called JSON convert. And you can find it in using uh, Newtons of JSON. So we can add a using directive here, Newtons of JSON. Or we could just say Newtons of .json .json convert dot, And it has uh, a method called deserialize object. Now deserialize object will ask us uh, what the model, the object model is. We can type it. And the type for us is the wallpaper search response. It's this, it's the root object. So basically we say, well, I'll hold up. So first of all, let's put in wallpaper search response. Now this will add a using directive of uh, my my application is called my wallpaper setter. So it's my wallpaper setter dot entities because we put it in the entities directory. And by default, if you create a new class in a subdirectory, it'll put it as a namespace. You can see that the namespace is wallpaper setter dot entities. Um, so it's perfectly fine. But you call this and it needs uh, the JSON that it needs to deserialize, so, which we have here as the content. So basically, with this here line, we use the library, uh, the, the Newtons of JSON library, which can understand this structure, the whole JSON. And we pass the whole JSON string into this deserialize object function to this method. And we tell it, hey, can you, can you uh, like, deserialize this or convert this JSON into wallpaper search response. And that's what we get back. So if I hover over this, this is a type wallpaper search response. So what I can do here is I can do API response dot data, which is an, an array of wallpaper models. And I can maybe either get the first one. So I'm just going to use a link uh, to, uh, I'm going to use using system.link to get the first uh, the first wallpaper model from that array and then I'm, I can access the access the path maybe store that here and that should be this should be a path to the first wallpaper in that response which if I do if I actually do the the response one more time it's gonna be... Uh, unless something changes in the meantime, it's going to be this. It's going to be this. I'm glad it's not as sketchy as I thought. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be the wallpaper, right? Now, 
Um, how does how do they know how to convert that? Well, um, Newtons of JSON can look at the type that we pass, right? For example, here, and it it understands the names implicitly in a certain way, like it knows that if this this object that it has starts with a thing called data, which is better demonstrated here, it's like oh, so we're if we say deserialize it into a certain type we mean the root object the root the whole string the whole json will be that object and it, it's like well the json says that there is a data uh that that there is a data um property in it and it looks at our object it's like hey you have a data property too cool and then it's like huh um it says that the data property is an array and it looks at your object and says oh wouldn't you know yours is also an array cool um i know json says that it's like a game json says um that this um that inside this array there are objects there are other objects and it looks at you it's like oh okay wallpaper model is an object then it looks into your wallpaper model that was by the way f12 to go into it um and then it's like hey um you know, there's an ID, you don't have an ID, doesn't matter, continues, and eventually it finds like, hey, there's a path, um, you have a path, brilliant, that's great. And as we talked about, it ignores the fact that maybe this one is lowercase and yours is uppercase, that's fine. Uh, you cannot name it something else, you can't do like path to wallpaper, that wouldn't work because it would look for exactly that. Uh, but what you can do, if you really, really, really want to rename it, you can have a JSON property, I'm pretty sure, add a JSON property um, uh, attribute, and basically say, and you put it like above the property that you define, and you can say, even though this is called path to wallpaper, uh, when you're reading JSON, uh, read this as just literally data right which is a nice way of uh, doing that but we can we can be all right with the implicit thing by the way the attribute in order to use the attribute you need to again be using newtons of json we're going to talk about attributes at length later on i swear so here it's gonna did it is it okay oh i named it data again i'm sorry it's supposed to be path uh, again, it was the same with path. I'm sorry. I just like confused myself a little. All right. So now we get the path. Now we get the first path of the of the wallpaper. So ideally, if we if we breakpoint it here and we run it uh, and we wait and we get here and we get breakpointed, if I hover over path, I get this URL. And if I copy this, just copy this real quick and go to that URL. It's that wallpaper, right? Cool. Now, how do I download that? Uh, that's a <laughs> that's going to be a problem for the next episode because this is already oh, this is already an hour. Um, so, in the next episode, we're going to talk about how to uh, how we download uh, images from the internet, from the path, because now we have a URL again. We started with a URL, and now we also have a URL, but we have it, it's different. Um, it's of what we want, right? And this is like fairly concise. It's not a lot of code. It's actually really cool. Um, and so we're going to talk about how to download that and set the wallpaper on Windows. Uh, and we're also going to, which was going to like, it was going to explode with all the different things we can talk about. And we're also going to talk about um, all the different things that we kind of like glossed over, like attributes, more about like JSON convert. We're going to play around with deserialization and serialization of our own JSON. We're going to play around with that. Um, so yeah, so stay tuned for the next episode of uh, this little, you know, exploring apis and c sharp for beginners uh one of the one last thing that i wanted to mention is that uh we have i have a discord server uh for like a tiny tiny community just for you know pa us passionate programmers um there are some fun 
activities as well. Yeah, just like, let's make this a nice little quaint community and not like a overblown server with like thousands of people so that nobody knows what's going on so that it's not like, let's make it manageable is what I'm saying, right? So feel free to join, talk about uh, programming, talk, have, if you have questions, feel free to ask them there. You can get in touch with me there. Um, we can hang out, we can share our projects. Maybe you have a cool idea of what to do with these wallpapers. Um, yeah, so hey, feel free to join uh, my Discord server, which you can find over at spellos.net forward slash discord. That's going to redirect you to the Discord invite uh, link in the description as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope this wasn't too boring for you. And I will see you guys in the next episode.